Hello, uh, my name is Christy Noonan. I'm a, a general and bariatric surgeon at Abington Hospital uh, just outside of Philadelphia. I am also an associate program director for general surgery, uh, bariatric fellowship faculty, and the director of surgical quality and safety. So I spend quite a bit of time living at the uh, confluence of uh, quality, safety, and education. Uh, so I have nothing to disclose, um, but my plan here for the next few minutes is to review uh, some educational techniques designed around improving uh, training autonomy as well as to discuss some tenets of a framework on how to improve autonomy and then trainee and faculty satisfaction in your program. So you likely heard in the previous talk a little bit about the uh, various views on autonomy but this is I think what most of us hear from our residents uh, consistently in the operating room. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a few uh, of the techniques that have been published specifically uh, starting with uh, what's called a resident optimized clinic. Uh, this was a program that just was described out of the University of Michigan. Um, when they surveyed their residents, they found that uh, their complaints about the clinic experience were that uh, number one, there was no, while it's mandated, there's no real guidance on how uh, clinic experience could be effective. The residents fe felt that they um, were not given clear expectations about what they were expected to do in clinic. They didn't feel like they had enough time to sufficiently work patients up. And they really felt like they had no autonomy because they were either um, scut monkeys or they felt like they were scribes and they really didn't have enough time to uh, consider and think on their own. So uh, they modeled this clinic um, in one attendings clinic. Um, you can see here the, the um, disparate opinions between the attendings and the trainees on how important clinic actually is. And when they restructured this clinic into a parallel structure like this, where uh, the residents were expected to uh, know about the patients ahead of time, read on them before they got to the clinic, and then were given ample amount of time and space to examine the patients and concoct a surgical plan, uh, they found that their satisfaction was uh, significantly improved. Uh, in fact, 100% of the residents uh, appreciated this model. They felt like they had more time and autonomy. 90% uh, 90, 90 of them felt that sufficient time was dedicated to uh, teaching and discussion, and 80% felt like the expectations were clear, and they very much appreciated the specifics of education over service. Now, when Dr. Klingensmith and the board surveyed general surgery residents in uh, 2016, uh, they found that a lot of um, U.S. grads were not feeling uh, confident to go into practice uh, on their own, but what, what she proposes is that um, some of this lack of confidence may not come down to clinical care and technical skill, um, that some of this lack of confidence may be related to what's been reported as an overwhelming demand for uh, information around um, practice management and how to actually engage in a practice. And so uh, these are the uh, topics uh, that were felt to be important. They've also been reported in a curriculum by Jones uh, at Methodist in Texas. And in this idea of a resident optimized clinic, uh, that provides an opportunity for most, if not all of these components to be worked into uh, the workflow for that clinic. So I think that's a great opportunity around optimizing resident clinics. Moving on to uh, more specific autonomy in the operating room, which is of course what the residents are always looking for. Um, there's multiple models out there. Um, some of the models uh, around teaching timeouts are um, sort of more of a recitation or a quiz to see if the resident is sufficiently prepared for the case. Uh, some of them go into the steps of the case, uh, the anatomy that's expected, or even specifically the roles of the different uh, participants in the surgery. Um, the one on the left, uh, the ETO, um, actually looks at the resident's past level of competence in this particular procedure uh, and an explicit discussion of how, uh, how they could achieve the next level in their competence. Um, that particular paper uh, from Lillamo did discuss um, recording uh, performance and autonomy data in the simple app, but it really wasn't a very comprehensive debriefing. And so um, this, this particular, all of these models tend to be a little bit one-sided and that it's mostly the trainee demonstrating uh, their prior skill or their, their uh, familiarity with the patient um, rather than uh, setting specific and explicit learning goals. The BID teaching technique uh, was introduced by Roberts et al. and has been uh, purported in uh, some faculty development model, modules out of the college. Uh, that involves a very explicit uh, debriefing suggested to be done around the scrub sink, asking the resident specifically what their learning goals uh, they would like to focus on. 
Uh, then intraoperatively, the uh, faculty uh, specifically focus on those learning goals and providing autonomy around uh, those specific issues. And then a very specific structured debriefing at the conclusion of the procedure uh, that allows the resident to, or the trainee to reflect on their perception of their performance, on their perception of where they struggled and why, um, allowing teaching of general rules, reinforcing what was done right, uh, and correcting any mistakes. And, and this, this kind of structured debriefing is important because uh, studies have shown that uh, faculty really don't uh, give an opportunity for discussion of lear learning goals uh, as often as they think they do, and they generally don't provide um, uh, not as much feedback as they think they do. In fact, uh, Snyder et al. showed that in, in one study, um, less than 20% of faculty uh, identified personal learning goals of their trainees, and uh, less than 40% talked about opportunities for improvement. Um, this, this kind of structured guided learning um, lets us focus on uh, guided discovery learning, which is sort of learning with with you know a guide as opposed to peer discovery learning uh, peer discovery learning is less than ideal because um, they're kind of wandering in the wilderness and they may not encounter all the scenarios uh, that need to be encountered for them to be competent um, in a specific uh, operation so best case scenario uh, in in the intraoperative aspect of autonomy would be uh, something like this uh, that the the trainee would know about the case well ahead of time. That would give them not only opportunity to review the patient chart, but would also give them opportunity to, um, to learn about that particular procedure and disease process. Discussion about the fact with the faculty ahead of time is also critical. Uh, trainees have consistently discussed that, you know, without the longitudinal comprehensive care, there's really insight into what's gonna happen in the case that um, only the faculty can provide. The pre-case debriefing on educational goals, uh, prior level of confidence, and strategies is crucial. Um, and I want to point out that this should be a two-way conversation, not just the trainee identifying what they believe their educational goals to be. Because you can see uh, in this table from Dr. Pugh's paper in 20, 2007 that uh, what the residents think or trainees think is important as part of educational goals don't exactly line up with what the faculty think. In fact, um, the three things that the residents think are uh, most important, like instrument use, uh, selection of suture material, are really at the bottom of the faculty's list, and the top three items like history, disease, anatomy, and outcomes are at the bottom of the residence list. So that's a place where there's obviously a discrepancy between the two parties that need to be reconciled. Um, I like the idea of the educational timeout. I think that does demonstrate the uh, adequacy of preparation, which is an independent predictor of giving autonomy. It also um, allows the rest of the team in the operating room to come together and understand exactly what's going to happen. The intraoperative teaching should be focused to those specific uh, targeted uh, educational goals. Too many uh, teaching points, too many goals in one case, and they get diluted, and the trainee doesn't remember them as well. So trying to focus on the specific goals. And then at the conclusion of the case, really a face-to-face -face debriefing is important uh, to talk about um, the specific goals, on um, the strategies that worked, the strategies that failed. Um, and I think there should be a structured instrument for this. I also think that's an opportunity for the uh, teacher or the faculty member to solicit feedback from the trainee on what educational strategies worked and didn't and how they could be better at both providing autonomy and teaching. So this is a two-way street. And then ideally in a uh, ideal world, you would wanna try and capture this somehow for assessment uh, purposes um, and using uh, a, a technology like Simple or some other um, app uh, might be ideal for that. So moving on to resident run services, unfortunately for something that used to be relatively uh, ubiquitous in surgery back in the day, um, there's really very little published on it. Um, I was able to identify uh, five papers uh, on, on assorted types of resident run services. Some of them are um, inpatient involvement only, some of them are outpatient involvement only, some were both um, and some only addressed uh, specific intraoperative autonomy. Um, really, uh, the one from Gunderson is, is the most comprehensive paper that's out there. Their uh, chief residents spend a variable amount of time on a service where they um, basically function in, in, in an outpatient, in a, in a general surgical practice. They uh, have block time, they have office time, they take call, um, they uh, do endoscopies. 
Um, and then they correlated this to the types of cases that they see in their first year in practice and found that it was not only well received by the residents, but reflected their first year in practice. Um, some other places have tried to give the residents more autonomy on the acute care surgery service, doing smaller cases such as coles and appies. Some of them look at um, actual outcomes, quality data. Some of them look at resident satisfaction and amount of autonomy uh, produced. And then there's an outpatient clinic at Mass General uh, that allows the residents to do lumps and bumps, um, also well received by those residents. Just to tell you a little bit about what we do, uh, I work at Abington. Abington is just outside of Philly. We have a general surgery residency with uh, five chiefs and 29 total residents. It's been around for quite a while. Uh, and we are an independent academic medical center. Uh, we've been affiliated with Jefferson for about five years, but most of our faculty in general surgery are in private practice. And so we have a, uh, a combination outpatient clinic as well as an inpatient chief service. We provide ambulatory and emergency care for the uninsured and underinsured. Um, for the entirety of their chief year, every single chief resident spends Thursday afternoon in the chief resident clinic, which is run by the chief residents. They see new patients, post-ops, and follow-ups from um, cases that were brought in through the emergency room, um, as well as their elective cases. They have OR block time, they have endo block time, um, they do take some uh, acute care surgery call, and they are basically a fully functioning practice with an office staff and a cross coverage schedule. We do try and integrate as much of the systems-based practice skills and practice management skills as we can into the clinic. In general, uh, that group, our five chiefs, they do about 200 cases, uh, elective cases in the OR per year, plus all of their added on uh, emergency ACS cases, and then we do about 120 screening and diagnostic scopes. Uh, the keys to making this work, uh, and it's an ongoing struggle, are that that chief functions as the primary surgeon for their patients. Uh, and what that means is that their responsibility to their chief patients takes precedence over everything else in their life, everything else in their professional life. Um, if they're attending on their service that they're rotating on is doing a Whipple that week and they want to do it, but they have a chief's case scheduled, the chief's case takes precedence. They are the primary surgeon for that patient. Um, and also, uh, myself and the chairman and the program director spend a significant amount of time ensuring adequate supervision in all of these venues. Uh, and I spend quite a bit of time um, analyzing the quality data to make sure that we're not providing a two-tier system. And we provide feedback in all of these venues on their uh, achievement um, based on our goals and objectives. So to talk about a framework for training autonomy, given these tools that are out there, I think number one, we need to recognize the need for change. The, so the world of surgery has evolved, the training climate has evolved, there's too much stuff to know and too little time. Um, the stuff that we used to learn by osmosis really needs to be much more deliberate, deliberate now. And so that involves education. Um, I think uh, the trainees and the faculty need to come to a same common set of expectations, of roles, behaviors, the types of behaviors that lead to uh, the demonstrate and trustability, um, as well as the kinds of behaviors that uh, lead faculty to entrustment. Uh, there's a lot of work going on around this in the EPA world. Um, I think there are, you, can, you can coach um, residents and you can coach faculty in, these, in demonstrating these kinds of behaviors uh, to make sure that um, the optimum environment for autonomy is there. For example, uh, Mendeshuk showed that while 98% of residents believe that um, reading the patient's chart, 98% believe that reading the patient's chart is important uh, for patient safety, only 57% of them 57 of them did it before every case. And that's the number one thing that faculty find is important in demonstrating that they, the resident or a trainee is prepared for the case and should be given uh, additional autonomy. So that, that kind of discrepancy uh, needs to be explicitly addressed. Ownership leads to autonomy and vice versa. That's been demonstrated conclusively. So uh, things like rounding on the patient afterward, meeting the patient before surgery, those are all things um, that can be taught to trainees. Um, how to prepare for cases, most of them have learned that on their own without any specific training. That's also been shown in the literature. Um, and so uh, designing a structured education program around this um, is important. There is a program called OpTrust. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about it later in measurement, but there's an OpTrust educational bundle that was put together by Dr. Minter uh, out of Michigan where they basically went through a whole curriculum with both the faculty and the trainees about how to improve these behaviors to increase trust and autonomy in the operating room. 
Um, this doesn't need to wait to the chief year. Uh, you should start early and be deliberate. Um, specific uh, uh, behaviors uh, demonstrated in faculty who are, are uh, noted for their ability to leave autonomy is let them start the case. Let your junior residents start the case. Don't just get them to the part that you think is important. Let them start the, th the case. Think and talk through the case with them. Tell them. Have them tell you what the next steps are in the case. Let them struggle until no more forward progress is uh, achievable. Um, you have to go into cases with an autonomy mindset and set expectations, planning ahead of time what specific parts of the case uh, you want them to do. All of these things and de-chunking operations uh, sort of set the stage for increased autonomy and that should start uh, in the junior resident years. Uh, there are uh, faculty modules out there, the uh, 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 Thoracic Surgery Journal, um, actually has a section in it called How I Teach It that helps thoracic surgeons break down their operations into pieces uh, to make it more teachable. Uh, you want to try and measure your autonomy. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about this WISH scale. It's now been incorporated in the Simple app and their learning collaborative. Not all of us have that kind of technology available, uh, but there is a um, validated tool called OpTrust that's based on um, five different domains and, uh, and outside observers of what's going on in the operating room. Um, this isn't the kind of thing that really can be assessed while you're inside the case, but I think having someone at least think through these behaviors or look through these behaviors can help the uh, trainee um, trainer dyad try and improve their interactions so that more entrustability is incurred. You want to try and smooth or reduce variability. And this is something that my residents struggle with considerably. They feel like they have to, they spend more time figuring out how each attending does their case specifically, rather than uh, being able to get autonomy in the critical portions of the case. And so I think training the faculty specifically to understand that you use this instrument and I use that instrument, um, and the resident doesn't know that, that doesn't necessarily mean that you shouldn't give them more autonomy in the case, or maybe you should all try and use the same instrument so they don't spend so much time worrying about that. We actually built uh, a Confluence site where data like that is stored um, so that the residents can read ahead of time. Once upon a time, it was called a surgical journal, but now they have it all on Confluence. And so multiple residents being there um, and adding little notes in there sort of gives them that leg up rather than having to do 20 cases with me. Um, they can know after one case um, how I like things done and we can move on to the autonomy pieces. Uh, we have to we have to come down to understand the difference or the the transition from repetition to EPAs. It used to be that you earn trust. You spend enough time in an operating room with a faculty member um, that they eventually learn to trust you. And we really just don't have that luxury anymore. So we need to start shifting uh, our our mental model as educators from individual trust to group trust. And that's where things like the EPAs come in. The EPAs are not really designed. Uh, for every item in every potential case. You know, the worst gallbladder in the world is not going to be one that necessarily every resident can do just because they've achieved that EPA. Um, but things like thinking about smaller things like central lines, and you know, once we sign them off in central lines, they're pretty much out there putting in central lines. And we need to start thinking about some of those things. If someone else has signed them off based on a program that we think is a competency, um, you know, we need to start trusting that group trust. And then most importantly, I think we need to improve feedback in both directions. Uh, the trainees are, are desperate for specific feedback. They hate it when we give them evaluations that say you need to read more or you're um, you know, keeping up with your peers in the operating room. Uh, there needs to be more concrete feedback and it needs to go in both directions. Uh, the faculty need to understand you know, what they can do better, how other faculty do things better, uh, what educational tips and techniques work for um, specific situations or specific residents. And then we need to extrapolate beyond the OR. Um, you know, these, these kinds of, um, of thoughts need to extend to the office, the wards, the endo suite. We tend to focus on the OR in surgery, but there's a lot more to, um, you know, to what we do and what's important than just what happens in the operating room. So the bottom line is I think there needs to be a very explicit understanding that autonomy is a sliding scale that's influenced by a lot of things. It's influenced by the trainee, by the faculty surgeon, uh, the specific case that's going on and the circumstances. You know, it's three in the morning is different than uh, seven in the morning. Uh, at the time of graduation, I really don't expect my chief residents to be doing my job while I drink coffee in the lounge all day. 
uh, but they should be functioning close to my junior partner. They should be able to execute effectively in nearly all aspects of surgical practice, uh, but they should be checking in with me periodically so that I can provide them feedback and so that I can either tell them about this crazy thing that happened to me one time or, or even throw them a what if this happened kind of curveball to see how they would respond. Uh, and so that is um, what I have to tell you about uh, autonomy.